Got a very nice tumble dryer, an AEG. Lava Mat Protex. Are you interested in the model number? Got your model number down there. You've got your uh, filter. Got your catch release for the condenser, which you have to cl clean every month or so. Wash the condenser out. Um, obviously, clean the filter out every time, but that's straightforward. But this has got, um, I rescued this on the way to the dump. It was, and a lot of these do that. When you turn it on, it runs for a little while and then it stops. And it gives an error in here of EHO, which is a power fault. Now, there's a few videos showing how to fix it online. Some are right, some are wrong, and there can be more than one cause, which uh, I'm trying to cover the most main causes in the video so you can uh, have a go at uh, fixing it. A lot of people say, oh, you just take the controller out and clean the fluff out, but you don't because it, disturbing the controller might fix the problem momentarily, but it's not the root cause usually. It's not fluff build up inside the controller. But these machines do get a lot of fluff inside, and I'll show you blowing it out later on. So it's quite easy to get apart. There's a screw in the back here and here, and then the lid slides back, and there's one screw uh, at the back on the side panel, and then the side panel engages on the dogs down the bottom and then it lifts over this lip okay so you've got one screw here in the front the back one is not normally populated here and then if you look in the back of this panel you can see down here are one two three four screws one right in the bottom corner down there all right so the to open this up you need uh, a torx bit driver and it's a T20, T20 Torx bit, and an ordinary number one Phillips screwdriver to undo the screws that, uh... actually you don't need it actually, you just need that one fastener, uh, that one T20 bit to take the controller out, take all the sides off, take the back off, all right? And while you're in there, I'll show you in a minute, blowing the fluff out because these get filled with fluff and it's a good idea to keep the fluff at bay. Um, this is about three years old, so as I say, I intercepted it on the way to the dump. So we'll take the controller out here. You basically release these clips on this top cover, the top cover flips off. Then you push the detent. I'll show you taking all the, the cables off and I'll see you indoors in a moment when we look at uh, what causes the EHO fault on the controller itself, all right? But otherwise they're superb machines, condenser. The, um, there is one that looks almost identical from the front. I had one before, which was sold to me as a condenser dryer. I fix these and give them away. Um, but down here, instead of the heating box, you've got a compressor. So that's the uh, heat pump version of this. But this is the condenser one, which is much, much faster at drying coves, but obviously takes a lot more power, probably three times as much power to do a cycle. All right, okay, so let's uh, resume indoors. Let's go have a look at this controller, which I'll take out. I've only got, I haven't got my cameraman here at the moment. So to remove this, as I say, it's very simple to remove. You have to make sure that you obviously unplug it first. Pull the um, earth clip off from under here. There's an earth clip, short wire, green wire. Pull that off. And then when you've got the controller loose, you can push these detents back here and here and the edge connectors and just gently pull them out. Don't pull them too hard and don't pull them by the wires. If they're tight, you might need to lube them out with a screwdriver, but I'm assuming you've got the wherewithal to remove and replace the controller. This is about mending the controller, so I'll see you indoors. Right, so here's the controller. What have we got? What have we got on this? Mains input, filter capacitors, fusible uh, resistor, 47 ohm. That's a special resistor. You can't just change that for an ordinary 47 ohm wire wound because it'll get red hot. These are fusible, so when you overload them, they have some kind of um, volatile material inside and it explodes and blows the covers off and then separates the wires. So they go with a small crack rather than a great big red hot uh, glow. So if you change this, be careful. Now we've got an LNK364GN, which is that thing there. That's the uh, switching power supply chip. Very low cost. Source of a lot of problems. Um, if it's completely dead, it's probably this chip gone. And when that chip goes, it normally blows that resistor. But we can see that normally you'd see some visible evidence that the resistor had blown up. But um, 
There, there is none. Look, it looks good. It looks nice and clean. We can just check that for 47 ohms in a minute. So we've got the HO fault. Now, on this power supply of this thing, they've got a 15 volt rail here which goes to the front panel, so the power for the front display and the, and the switch matrix. Got some OPSO isolators here, um, and you've got a plus 5 and a minus 7 volt power supply, I think, and that gives you 12 volts through relays. Now, these are all regulated together, and um, if one of the bits of circuitry is drawing too much current, um, say the, pa the front panel's got a bad display or something, this is trying to regulate and arbitrate between the needs of all the power supplies and here there is a comparator there's a precision voltage reference and if one of the um, devices on here takes too much current or too little it can't regulate anymore because it's regulated based on its expectation of what the, vi the current loads on the different supplies are going to be so it's a, they've skimped on the power supply and uh, they suffer for it and you get the EHO fault. But having said all that and explained it, there's your micro down there, a bunch of relays control the peripherals down here, you know, the the, uh, the motor, the heating relay, uh, the solenoid or whatever, water pump for the uh, for the condenser. This is a condensing dryer, this one. But I think usually when you see this, um, you can see this white PCB material here it's cheap and it's nasty and it is prone to flexing it's a double sided board but I think I'm right in saying it's not plated through or is it? No it must be plated through because it's plated through holes here okay so what could be causing it? Well normally sometimes you see this thing as uh, shit the bed and you can see a big uh, top is blown off or there's a small fissure in the top but that looks okay on this one and I'll show you how to check the power rails but we haven't finished inspecting yet and we should just have a quick deco of this and see whether we can spot what's wrong alright so nothing untoward on this side there's no bulging capacitors they're all nice and flat on the top you can see when these go sometimes you know, a little bit of a leak or sometimes you can see the, the top is expanded and it's kind of, this is a crimped through the aluminium case there so it's almost cut through, a bit like the top of a coat can when you pull the ring pull and if any pressure builds up inside, because these are wet capacitors then it starts to boil and it pressurises it and you can see this starts to dome in the extreme cases it will crack open and a little bit will, the jizzle will come out, okay but they all look okay, this is the mains uh, smoothing capacitor rect half halfway rectified mains supply so that's the, uh, what we got there, got a 400 volt 22 microfarad, but that looks okay as well. And that they used to be, a, on the cheaper machines these capacitors can be problematic, but when they use better quality ones they should last. This machine's about three years old by the way. Right, so what can it be? Let's have a look. 390 ohm looks alright. I'm not going to bother getting the meter out at the moment because we just haven't finished quite inspecting it yet. Now what you've got around this end is a bunch of relays where the power goes through soldered onto a very poor quality service mount board and I can see something, I don't know if you can spot that, let's see if you can spot it as well. Let's go into tele macro mode. So now we're in the tele macro mode and I need to find something to balance this on. Tele macro! <laughs> Got a box or something when you want one. Whoa, focus you focusing thing. We want you to focus all day long. Right, yeah, that's focusing nicely, isn't it? Yes, that is. Okay. Can we get any closer than that? Or is that all she wrote? I think that's all she wrote. Can we get any closer? Yes, we can. Haha, -ha, how's that? So let's scoot around these solder joints and look straight away. Can you see? Can you see that? We have a fracture. 
down on that joint. Where are we? That joint there. You can see the fracture. Poor quality bird shit soldering or sparrow shit we used to call this. And you can see where this one, look, this is on the back of a relay by the way. You can see where it's been arcing. And you'd be surprised to know that um, mains voltages can um, cause it to sort of oxidise and spark and there can actually be a gap there. So, if I put my other glasses on. We've got a bit of an optical impasse here. That's a bad one, that one. I'll give you an example. Where are we? Can't even bloody well find it now. Can you see that? That's not a ring of, that's not a sort of a tied mark of any flux. That's actually where the joint has cracked away. And it's a bit unclear why it does it. It looks like a bright solder joint, but in fact, there's a number of these relay joints which are looking very iffy indeed and that's a particularly bad one next to where it says S45 down there. Can you see that? So what we need to do I think is that's probably the cause of the power fault on this occasion that uh, the mains isn't getting through cleanly and you can see there's a number maybe half a dozen of these joints are cracked now, I don't know if it's the vibration or what it is, but it's particular for these to these AEG boards. These actually, it's not AEG at all. Look, it's uh, it's made by Electrofux, right? So yeah, Let's see if we can get a microscopic picture of one of these. Can you see that crack? just about there round that you've got a crack where the wire is and the solder on, on the wire is broken away from what's probably a dry joint in production not enough of the old flux you know how much we like flux on this channel don't you so should we do a spot of resoldering on that then shall we okay it's gonna get vertigo now because you'll zoom out there you go so what we're going to do, there we are, macro vision, zoom in a bit, so you can see what's going on, and I'm just going to get a little bit of the old, you don't have to use Kingbow, the RMA218, but um, I'm just a sad old man with a flux fixation. Guilty as charged. It's going to apply some liberal fluxing around here so that we don't get the same issue going on. And we're just going to go around for a general resolder. So what's causing our problem is dry joints on this board, but they're very subtle. I tell you, if you haven't got good eyesight, you won't be able to see them. He said turning soldering iron on, because he'd forgotten. And then we have some soldering fun. If you haven't got a soldering iron, get one. They're good fun. Industrious. Right, okay. So we're going to set the iron to, uh, I think, 300 and 70 degrees. I'm using I'm using leaded solder because it reworks easier and this isn't going to the skip this is being re refurbished it's a little bit of lead in it but nothing to write home about see that? see it melt out? Isn't that interesting? Yes, it is. Now we've got a lovely soldery joint. Lovely. See if that one does the same. Let's do the next one. If I just heat it, look, look at that. Not enough solder on it, boys.
lovely. The tin, uh, dead free solder um, forms things like dendrites, and they're like little spikes of tin, microscopic spikes. Let's see if that one does the same. No, we're okay on that one. Lovely, beautiful. Reminds me of a volcano when the uh, when the crater collapses when the new lava chamber comes along. Yeah, some of these don't look particularly good. I'm just going to go around and solve them all because that's the th clearly the thing to do. It's an odd thing. It's a ticking time bomb. It must cost for customers a fortune. Do you know this uh, machine was on the way to the tip? I happened to stumble across it and offered the guy 20 quid. And uh, he graciously accepted. And now it's going to be repaired and put to good use. Some grateful person will get this. Or an ungrateful one. It's one of my family. Right, anywhere else, yeah. All over the place. I'm going to solder all the relays. It seems particularly that one relay was the bad one there, but I'm going to do them all. More solder required, please. Actually, I haven't done such a simple repair. You could be forgiven. If you took this out, you can't see those unless you've got really good eyesight. So um, get your specs on, get your squints on for this. There's one there, look. Let's see if that one craters out when I heat it up. Put a bit of flux on it. Let's see if that one craters out, shall we? So right, once that was fluxed. Still a crack around the wire there. Tin dendrites, dead free solder. That's why they can't use it in outer space. Um, Incidentally, there's another problem on these machines. There's a couple of um, Ducati um, capacitors on the motor, next to the motor, next to the drive motor that drives the drum round. There's a couple of Ducati capacitors, and some of them are made in Romania. And if you've got the side off this thing, you want a, and a capacitor, a, a voltmeter that's got a capacitance range on it, you want to check those because. They have a habit of just creeping away to zero, self-destructing to zero um, microfarads. Now I've, 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 um, I'll check them before I put it back on because sometimes you find like the one in mostly the seven microfarad one, which is the larger of the two, is the one that, uh, as I mentioned before, creeps lower and lower and lower as it self heals itself, and eventually gets to the stage where the the motor will hum but it won't rotate and it's that capacitor. Now the 7 microfarad one is about 20 quid. I don't know if it's a particular but there's an 8 microfarad one exactly the same size but it's 8 instead of 7 and they're about half the price. So if you want to save yourself 10 quid then get the 8 microfarad one instead of the 7. That's my, my tip for that. Right, well there's one there. Look, oh, it just keeps propping up like Turn it up. Expensive machines, these. You think they'd probably both solder the bloody things properly. 
Must cost the consumer a fortune, this uh, shitty soldering joints. And the problem is this, uh, this, is this bloody cardboard, compressed cardboard PCB and the reflow soldering of um, not enough land around here to actually accept, uh, um, put enough solder on the joint, you can see that. They made the pads bigger and relieved the, etch, the uh, solder resist so that you could solder onto more pad. You'd have more copper there and a bigger joint would give you more solder. This has gone through the wave too fast. And of course, we used to coat these things in flux. The whole thing would be swimming in flux when it went over the solder wave in the machine. But now it's um, a spray, no clean solder. It's, it's kind of greener, but you know, consequently, it's not as good either. You have to really know your process. Of course, this is made in China. Uh, the engineer who laid this board out should be shot because he is a one man eco disaster. And if you're watching, I'm happy to train you up on how to lay out a decent PCB because you don't deserve your title. Woke up one day, thought you were an engineer, but you weren't really, you just somebody knew how to do a CAD, had a rough idea about electronics. Okay, any more for any more? Should be more systematic, it's talking to you guys, you put me off. Oh, there's one. Gonna have some dry clothes now. They do another lava mat, I think AEG, and it looks almost exactly the same from the outside, but when you take it off, um, it's a um, heat pump tumble dryer. They've just literally put a heat pump inside the same design. It's almost exactly the same inside, apart from the heat pump and the heat exchanger in the back of the unit. If you're thinking of buying a heat pump tumble dryer, there's two things you should know about a heat pump tumble dryer. One, is that they wear your clothes out because they take so damn long and the other thing is they don't work at temperatures outside below five degrees so if you put them in the outhouse in the winter unless you've got an heated out outhouse you've got, which you know we can afford to eat the heat their outhouse these days if you've got one outside in a shed or a, an unheated outhouse and when it gets down to below 10, 10 degrees they take ages and at five degrees they don't work at all they just haven't got enough energy to recover any heat from the air without icing up. You'd think they put a de-icing heat um, air source heat pumps for domestic heating. Do they have a in cold weather the um, where they're cooling the outside air that if it's moist you can get ice build up so they switch off the compressor or reverse the compressor and um, melt the ice off and then carry on. But clearly tumble drives haven't accommodated that they just say in the small print after you've bought it, oh by the way, you can't use this outside in the shed or your outhouse or your garage because uh, it ain't going to bloody work. You have to spend Christmas with all your knickers on the radiator. Right, I think I got them all, but you saw the problem. And we'll go and stick her back together, which is the reverse of putting, taking it apart, which I've already showed you. Um, so get some of the old love juice. Isopropyl alcohol, squirt it on liberally, and get the wife's toothbrush and give it a clean. Beautiful. Better than new now. Those little cracky joints were the reason for a three year old tumble dryer was at the dump, it was on its way to the dump intercepted by yours truly. It's a nice machine. Alright, well there you go. It's soldered up. Check the solder joints on the back of relays. If the resistor is blown up, get a fusible 47 ohm resistor, change that, change the LNK. Uh, 364GN. Got some of those in stock if you want some. Um, and also check your capacitors. And if you can't get it to work still, it might be worth desoldering the capacitors. Some of them you can check in circuit. But yeah, I think that's fixed it. I'll go and put it back together now and we'll see what happens, shall we? Thanks.